in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Whether you go on holiday, or buy a pair of trainers off eBay, or use some NHS service, a short while after, you get some kind of text message or email asking you for your feedback. Our world has kind of been taken over by feedback survey things. If you work for any big company, then you'll probably get an annual staff satisfaction survey. And it's the same for students. And actually now our diocese does one of these surveys for us priests. We're all encouraged to give our opinion on what's right and wrong in the way things are working. And of course, the uh, response is completely anonymous. Obviously, these things make sense because if you get your questions right and analyze the data well, changes can be made and you get a happier workforce and a better workforce. And this isn't too different from market research, uh, how that's used in sales and how opinion polls are used by political parties. You try and identify the values and desires of your target audience and then you shape whatever you want to offer them accordingly. You change what you do. So all that makes a lot of sense when we're dealing with business and politics. But we notice in today's gospel that this isn't how our Lord works. He starts off his talk with his disciples with a kind of survey. Jesus wants to know what people are saying about him. What is the opinion of those who are hearing him? Probably we've just got a little snapshot of that conversation that he had with his disciples. But our Lord wants to get the feedback from their experience, from their research, what the people are saying. And they tell him, some are saying, some people think he's John the Baptist back from the dead. Maybe Jeremiah, maybe a prophet. And then he asks them their opinion. And it seems like there's probably a bit of a silence. They don't want to reveal their cards. Who knows exactly what they're thinking? But then we are told Peter speaks out and he names Jesus for who he really is. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. But the point is, this isn't Peter of his own knowledge and wisdom joining the dots about Jesus. Because our Lord replies, it is not flesh and blood that has revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And this is the key point for today's sermon. We don't find out the answer to who Jesus is by consulting surveys or even asking intelligent people for their opinion. God himself is the only one who can give us the correct explanation about Jesus. And that actually applies to all the truths of religion. The means of getting at the truth when it comes to religion is to ask one simple question. What has God revealed to us about this? The answer does not come from what do most people think or what would most people like to hear. I guess this might sound all a bit obvious. But actually, how often do people secretly have in their heart the idea that the Catholics shouldn't believe X or Y anymore? And instead of following what our Lord revealed, we should consult the culture around us and reshape our beliefs to make them fit in, or as they would put it, to be more relevant. And you know, that has actually been the way of Protestantism from its beginning. Think about the history class at school. Remember Henry VIII? He had weaknesses in a certain area, and then he decided he would remake the Christian religion to suit his own preferences. And the thing has only got worse with time. The same thing that Henry began has been magnified. So right now, in the Church of England, you probably don't know this, but in the Church of England, they've got a structure which essentially means that if a majority of people in its, in its parliament, in its synod, if they want a change in teaching or practice, they get a change. Maybe it's two-thirds, but basically... Basically, the whole thing is changeable based on what, what people's opinions are. And ironically, contrary to their hopes and expectations, 
A religion that accommodates itself to reflect the values of a culture dies out because it loses its prophetic voice. Well, it loses the voice of God. This only uh, comes from standing firm and proclaiming unchanging truths that God has revealed. But that was the problem from the beginning of the Church of England, because when Henry found his own, founded his own religion, he was denying the possibility of unchanging truths, because he started his religion on the back of rejecting what was always taught and believed by Christians, that the Pope had a special authority over the church beyond any king or politician, and that marriage is a sacrament that creates a permanent bond between the couple. We could say, then, that there are two fundamental attitudes, one represented by St. Peter and one by King Henry. St. Peter's attitude, we get the truth concerning religion by accepting the revelation from God. Henry's attitude. Truth about religion comes from opinion and from the views of the strongest voices in society. And, you know, this whole approach of consultation and changing, uh, suiting, so suiting a particular time in history, it actually doesn't, it, it hasn't proved to be a very good approach. Um, when we look back in history, for instance, look at the time of Hitler in Nazi Germany. It's amazing, or it's shocking, how many Protestants backed him. The official Protestant religion in Germany, or like the group representing all the Protestant sects, that decided to back him. And obviously there were exceptions and there were some people that left that official church like I mean we think about Dietrich Bonhoeffer who uh, realized that this was was a completely uh, false approach but he was in the minority um, and this completely contrasts with the Catholic Church in Germany at that same point in history which totally as a body opposed Hitler and his evil ideas of racial purity and euthanasia and the priests were all required in 1937 to uh, release, a st to, to, to say from the pulpits a statement condemning these evil ideas of Hitler. The mainline Protestant groups, they changed their message. They got with the cultural program of that particular society. So maybe it should be no surprise that the same Protestant groups in Germany right now in 2023 have adopted the new truths of our present secular culture, embracing false ideas about gender ideology, abortion, homosexual relations, and they focus their attention on topics that get high on political opinion polls rather than the things that Jesus revealed as the most important to help us get to heaven. Okay, so that's the two approaches. St. Peter, accepting what God has revealed. Henry, Protestantism, making what we believe reflect the culture around us. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't care about the culture around us. And the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church actually does this. That's this thing going on in Rome this autumn. Um, the Catholic Church wants to listen to what's confusing and bothering people so that it can um, respond to them. But it's a great mistake to think that when the Catholic Church is doing a listening exercise, it's a preparation for some kind of mutation and re reinvention. Like I said, the idea is the Catholic Church listens in order to hand on the same unchanging teaching in a way that hopefully people will be able to understand and get a handle on, because it's using their language and touching their experiences. Our second reading today speaks a lot on the same topic. Here's a little extract from it. How rich are the depths of God? How deep is wisdom and knowledge? And how impossible to penetrate his motives or understand his methods? Who could ever know the mind of the Lord? Who could ever be his counsellor. That's a warning to all those 
who think that we get at the truth by reflecting the values of our culture. God's uh, teaching is going to be deep. It's not always going to be something that we just grasp straight away. And you've probably found talking to your secular friends how hard they find it to accept um, God's revelation. Um, but that's the point. We still have to accept God's revelation. The alternative, think about how St. Paul finishes that line. Who could ever know the mind of the Lord? Who could ever be his counselor? The alternative to accepting what God has revealed, like St. Peter did, is becoming God's counselor, telling God how he should have done it um, or how he should do things in order to be more successful. Um, and um, actually, there's, there's a lot of people doing that. In fact, that's what, that's what there's even people in the Catholic Church trying to do that, trying to be God's counselors, how God really should have done things. It actually reminds me of a, a little moment in my life, one of the few times I've ever sat down with someone uh, important in the eyes of the world. I happened to be at a friend's house, and for some strange set of circumstances, the only other two people at this meal, uh, it was a, uh, a member of the House of Lords and a long-serving MP in our parliament. And um, the story is important because, like, the uh, Baroness, the one, the member of the House of Lords, she was a really significant woman. She had actually been one of the chief architects of New Labour. She'd helped reshape, reinvent the Labour Party uh, and directed their massively successful 97 election campaign. But because of that, because of how she had reinvented the Labour Party, she had an awful lot of advice taken from her political experience about how the Catholic faith needed to change, how she saw that the Catholic Church needed to do something like the Labour Party did uh, in just prior to the 1997 election. Now, I won't deny that this lady was super smart in so many areas and so capable, um, amazingly talented, impressive woman. Uh, very few people I've ever sat down with that struck me so much as being so uh, striking a figure. But you know, in this area, she was totally mistaken. And, uh, and that's because, because our faith is not built on the back of polls, of research data, and the shifting sands of public opinion. And I kind of timidly put that point to her. Um, she was viewing the church as if it was a political party that could come up with a new manifesto, completely different from the last one, in order to, you know, get more support or something. Instead, we need to realize that our Lord has established a kingdom, uh, and the teachings of that kingdom of, that are found in that church don't flip-flop over the course of a weekend. They remain certain and true whether a society likes it or not. God reveals his truth, then we assent to it and try to grow to understand it better and better. And we heard in the gospel that Jesus actually gives Peter a special authority as a part of this. And so as I kind of close the sermon, just a little point, little word on, on this uh, subject also. Peter receives the keys, that is, He's made the leader of the church on earth. And Jesus says the decisions he makes on earth will be things that are reinforced in heaven. This is kind of the basis of the teaching of papal infallibility or one of the texts for papal infallibility. And this makes sense. If Jesus wants his church to remain steady amidst the waves, amidst the changing culture that the church inhabits, he needs a mechanism so the church can confront new problems with the same authority that he has. But fundamentally, the Pope is there to serve and protect what God has revealed. That's exactly what St. Peter did in the Gospel. He conveys um, not what flesh and blood tells him, but what God reveals. So if a pope says something, 
that goes against what the church already teaches and what God has revealed, well, that's a certain sign that it's flesh and blood speaking, um, that he's not uh, acting from infallibility. He's just giving his mistaken point of view. Um, Infallibility is a special gift uh, that the Pope has, but is only very rarely invoked. Uh, It's something that is invoked in moments of great confusion when the answer isn't obvious and where the church hasn't already given a definitive answer. In that little space, that's where papal infallibility can be uh, operated. And 2,000 years in, pretty much everything has been responded to. We're really blessed uh, to live at this point in history. We're able to pick up a copy of the Catechism, which contains a reference to all the infallible teachings given through the ages. So we aren't prisoners to what our present culture values at this brief moment. Instead, we stand firm with St. Peter, clinging not to what flesh and blood has worked out, the voice of public opinion, but what God has revealed to us through Jesus and which he protects through his church till the end of time. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.